track the patterns of very interesting things. And they can be creative or destructive. And a sense of vision or a clear purpose, they're attractive patterns and they actually draw people. And so they're absolutely key. Now, they're different things. They're similar yet different because a clear purpose answers the question why. Why are we doing this? And a vision answers what we're going for. Similar yet different. Just looking at purpose, great leaders always start with why. Because when we start with the why, we engage like-minded people and we engage the heart. Because the typical questions, what, how, who, when, where, these engage the mind. They're rational things. But the why engages something deeper. It attracts the core. Welcome to Wedding Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwoskin, and today I'll be speaking again with Peter Lowry, who is a featured teacher along with me in Rhonda Byrne's book, The Greatest Secret. Peter Lowry lives in Melbourne, Australia, where he focuses on awakening people to their true nature and living as flow, intuitively, creatively, and at ease. So, Peter, how does the work that you do in companies and what's spoken about in Rhonda's book, how, how do they complement each other? How do they connect? Uh, Hale, when it all comes down to it, it's the same thing. Uh, there's a deep hunger within every human being for authenticity, for actually living deeply, spontaneously, naturally. And whether I'm dealing with a senior executive or a spiritual seeker, in the end, it's the same dilemma, the same issue, and the same hunger. Yes, I, I agree with that. Everyone, whether they're conscious of it or not, are looking for the same thing. I, I noticed the same thing. I haven't done corporate work in a while, but when I worked in companies, the there was definitely the same kind of hunger there. And, and it's, it was wonderful to see that when you brought in these concepts in a language that they could understand, that they really embraced them and mm -hmm. it positively effect, affected their bottom line, which is what they yeah. want too. So yeah. it all yeah. goes together. Yeah. So, Absolutely. uh, can you tell me the difference be, uh, between vertical uh, and horizontal development? Can you explain that? Sure, sure. And thank you for bringing that up because that's a key distinction, Hale. And because most, most development is horizontal. And if you go to a business school or do a training course, it's usually horizontal development. And to explain it, it's, it's uh, I'd use a metaphor. Horizontal development is like a, a container, having a container, a cup, and filling it up. So whether that's learning communication skills or learning negotiation strategies or listening skills or learning to actually create visions, these things are, are horizontal. Wonderful, incredibly useful. Vertical dif development is a different order altogether. And to use the same sort of analogy, it's like a, um, it's like a new container, a larger container with, with an increased capacity. Vertical development is like seeing the world through new eyes. You know, when we see through the self-limiting stories, the mental models that uh, we all build and create, when we start to see through those self-limiting stories, and then when we start to actually let go of those old hurts and pains, and those knots start to unravel, and when feedback starts to become something useful rather than something to defend against, things open up. 
And particularly when, when we start to illuminate those blind spots, those dark corners in our psyche, and we start to discover a whole new capacity of being. Hmm. Yeah, beautifully put. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's kind of like you can tell people what to do, and that is just adding to the accumulation. But if you yeah. show, if you ha help people see it from a totally di a new point of view, a, a more expanded point of view, more open point of view, more clear point of view, mm -hmm. then the skills are secondary. It's not that you shouldn't have these skills, but mm. it's secondary. The primary is shifting where they're, how they're approaching whatever the problem or the issue is. So yeah. very well put, thank you. Yeah, um, and, and how, yeah. it's how it's, um, and that, that distinction, it's, um, it's not about information. It's in the end, it's transformation. Yes. And uh, you know, it's like, I remember I once was working with this very senior EU executive. And he had been put in charge of a, uh, a, a committee that was looking at standards to change right across Europe. And all the members of the committee came from different countries and from different companies. So they're all positioning and jostling. Now he was, um, he'd been made the chair because of his technical abilities but he was woefully equipped to actually deal with the job. Right. So when he approached me, uh, he knew that he could, his current reality just wouldn't work. And uh, so working with him, um, we, we just discovered very quickly that he had old stories from his early life that uh, to attempt to influence people or negotiate, that was wrong. You know, he saw salespeople as like evil people. Mm. And so the skill set he needed to actually lift these people up to a higher plane of reality and start to explore different options, all he, those skills were totally unavailable to him. And for him to be successful in this new role, he was like him becoming one of these bad people. So by looking deeply and exploring his, in those dark corners and those blind spots, he started to see through these self-limiting stories. And then he was able to quickly acquire the skills once he'd changed his mental model, once his eyes had opened. And of course, the results were way beyond anyone's expectations. That's this great. Is this, this thing about vertical development, it's transform who we are. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely transforming the container as yeah. opposed to moving things around in the container or filling it up. But it's definitely much more effective. <laughs> and the truth, and also, wouldn't you say that in personal development, the same thing is true too? It's not just in a corporate environment. Absolutely. What I found is when you work with individuals who have specific goals they're working on, mm -hmm. generally, they're, the only obstacle is their mental mindset about it, yeah. Not, yeah. not the situation. So yeah. if they let go of their mental mindset, then they're dealing with what is as it is, and it's yeah. much more effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then... Uh, how does what you do relate to allowing people to understand the gift that is now? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's the, um, that's the secret. <laughs> and, the, and the present is the gift. You know, because we're really here. Most of us live in yesterday, tomorrow either projecting some idealized future or going back and rerunning some horror story. So this yesterday, tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow, we miss the only thing that is, this immediacy, the wonder of this present. And learning to just relax and be present to what is, is one of the secrets. And, and, and the funny thing is, even if you think about the yesterday, you're still here. Right. Even if you're fantasizing about tomorrow, you're still here. 
And this, you know, it's so popular, this thing about trying to get into the now. I say, try to get out of the now. <laughs> no matter what, what, where, where, you, where you are conceptually, you can only ever be here because everything right. simply happens here. Yes, yes. And so encouraging people to just rest and settle into this presence, they discover extraordinary things. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, the now really is a gift. And also, uh, I think if you're, if you're looking at this from a more business point of view, you, you can probably understand that the only time you can do anything about anything is now. <laughs> this is it <laughs> this is all there is uh, exactly a <laughs> yeah, yeah. hundred years ago Einstein said the sacred the, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant mm. and the trouble is we've created a world that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift yes and so when we actually stay present to what is, when we open up to this, the gift reveals itself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is how people think that being present, being here, means you just ignore the future. And people say, well, how do you plan? Of course, if we're sitting down planning, that's a present activity. Exactly, exactly. You yeah. know, and so creating a vision or a strategy or a plan is a very creative act. And the more present we are to it, the more effective we are. Yes, yeah. uh, definitely. And again, we had a plan to have this conversation. That's why, <laughs> that's why we're having this conversation. There's nothing wrong with planning. The, the problem is most of us make a plan and then we and then we don't let go of the plan and allow what is to be in this moment. We're still planning sitting in front of someone, we're still planning how the conversation is going yeah. to go. And that just gets in the way. <laughs> yes, it always amuses me, you know, like disappointment is not a spontaneous activity. Because <laughs> if I'm to disappoint, first of all, I'm, I'm not available to be here because I'm projecting about how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And when that moment arises, I'm not available and present to the moment because I'm starting to compare, is this like how I imagine it? Right. Then it's only in the next moment because I can now disappoint. That's right. It's a it's a it's a long term activity. It takes a lot. Oh of yeah, work. it takes <laughs> takes a lot of work actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and likewise, just being simply here, it doesn't mean that we ignore the past. Because no. one of the things one of the things that's so important is to actually to reflect and just yes. be present and just be still and just. Reflect on the day, the moment. Yes. Re just recreating and discovering the gift, the sacred gift in the present. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And a lot of people uh, change the external. Mm. Uh, they, they change how they're presenting without actually falling through and changing both who they are, how they come, the inner container, but even their activities. Yeah. Uh, and so how does what you do relate to that? Because it to deal with that particular issue that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. And like, it is, in essence, it's the distinction between what we say and what we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often find in corporate work, work, people love to focus on values get together and wonder <laughs> right. about values, you know. And of course, these are usually a list of shoulds. And they're, all, they're good things, you know, absolutely. Yet, it's far more important to actually focus on behaviour, what we actually do. Yes. Because every parent knows it's, it's do what I, what I do, not what I say. Everybody watches what we do. And so it's so critical if you want to change, focus on behavior. Yeah. Focus on the doing. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, one of the things that also 
it, not just in, in a company environment, but in, in life in general, is we're kind of rushing back to the now again. We're kind of rushing through the moment as though we could get out of it. I love when you said, <laughs> try to get out of the now. I say that all the time to people yeah. when, when they're, when they, you can sense the rushing energy. Mm -hmm. I, I say, mm -hmm. okay, wait a minute. Or, or when they're even more insidious for many people who are looking for spiritual growth is they try to get into the now mm -hmm. and that activity is looking away from the now. So I, yeah. I always say the same thing. He said that yeah. try to get out of the now. And as soon as they do, they realize they can and what a futile yeah. thing that is. Yeah. So be in our rushing, we often miss that, that time to just simply, uh, reflect on what who you are what's real what's true but also just even reflecting on what you're doing in your job or what you're doing in with your company uh, so can you talk about that a little bit the importance of building reflection into your life well reflection is one of the secrets of life and this distinction we started with between horizontal and vertical development Reflection is one of the ways we enter into deep de vertical development. And uh, the thing about reflection, you have to build it in. If it, Say if that again, next, you have to do what? You, you, have, you have to build it in. Oh, you have to build it in. Absolutely. You to, Absolutely. Yeah. You can't just add it on. Yes, I'll do that later because that's the first thing that goes. You have to build it into the, into the fabric of your life. And when I ran a consulting companies, I would always insist that every meeting was three. Pre-meeting, the planning, the meeting, then the reflection. And building reflection into the fabric of our life. And of course, in the business world, that's particularly easy because everything is templated. So you take a meeting, and if the meeting's for one hour, the last 10 minutes, reflection. And I found by working for years, for decades, mentoring people, whenever I have a, a deep conversation, we always spend the last few moments reflecting. What did we learn? What worked? What didn't work? How could we improve this? And when you build that into the structures of meetings, you then start to have iterative, ongoing development as we learn and grow from our experience. Mm -hmm. Action reflection is the key. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's sort of like there are always endings. You know? End of the day, a natural time to reflect. And people often do that spontaneously in the, tra in the train on the way home or riding their bicycle home, whatever it is, just reflecting on the day or sitting and chilling out in the evening, just reflecting how did it go? Yes. End of the week, end of the month, end of the quarter, end of the year. Just those, all of those markers can be a trigger to reflect. Yes, yes, absolutely. But also, I don't think you mean look back on the, the, the event and second guess yourself. You're trying to, it's really more of a looking for, uh, for what really worked, what might work better. It's, yeah. it's a more positive thing because a lot of people spend a lot of time reflecting on the past yeah. Uh, in an automatic way or by beating themselves yeah. up or yeah. Yeah. second guessing themselves and uh, and things like that. Can you give me the distinction? Sure. Absolutely. And reflection is, is a present still activity, just being there and just, uh, just noticing and allowing the thoughts, the feelings, the images, the ideas, the insights just to appear and disappear, like watching the clouds in the sky without buying into or ruminating, just simply just notice. And when we start to reflect, reflect on events and we start to do that over time, we start to notice patterns. And the patterns, if we start to reflect on the patterns that appear, we start to notice the structure, the deep, the systems, the deep structure of our psyche, of our interpersonal plays. 
And when we just keep on just noticing without judgment, without trying to change anything, simply being with, wisdom appears. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And also uh, how this relates, uh, would you agree with this, that, that how this relates to someone who's not really wanting to use this to improve their business, that if you build in, you can also reflect on that there, you can reflect on patterns, absolutely, but you can also reflect on that which never changes. Absolutely. How was how was that living presence that I am mm. uh, present to whatever it is that I just went through? Yeah. That th yeah. that doing that doesn't that also help people? Oh, absolutely, and it's the same thing. It's just like uh, refl action reflection. It's the key for transformation, and just about anybody who I work with. We always come, we come very quickly to reflection and just building it in there because a, a reflected life is a transformed life. Hmm. Great. Hmm. Yeah, we have, so often we rush through life and also hmm. we don't, so often we rush through life and we don't um, really reflect on what's actually happening in this moment. We're so hmm. busy getting mm. lost in the drama of it. So yeah. uh, that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what is the, how does uh, purpose and vision fit into your work? Mm. Uh, well, there's a beautiful metaphor from uh, chaos theory. And they talk about attractor patterns. And these are constellations of energy, which draw energy. And the metaphor, it's rather like a, a snowball rolling down a hill. It starts small. And as it moves, it gathers up snow and gets bigger. And as it gets bigger, it starts to go faster. And as it goes faster, it digs in deeper and, and attracts more snow. So you have this accelerating dynamic. And so attractor patterns very interesting things and they can be creative or destructive mm -hmm. and a sense of vision or a pur clear purpose they're attractor patterns and they actually draw people and so it's they're absolutely they're, they're absolutely key now they're different things they're similar yet different because a clear purpose answers the question, why? Why are we doing this? And a vision answers what we're going for. And similar yet different. Mm -hmm. And just, just looking at purpose, great leaders always start with why. Because when we start with the why, we engage like-minded people and we engage the heart. Because the typical questions, what, how, who, when, where, these engage the mind, they're rational things, but the why engages something deeper. It attracts the core. I think as the, uh, the German philosopher Nietzsche used to say, when we understand why, we can tolerate almost any what or how. Hmm, that's so the why. Yeah, the why, yeah. so beautiful, you know. Yes. And so uh, uh, just when we, when, and like this is in all areas of life, you know, children know this intuitively. Why, why, why? It's <laughs> such a, yeah, it's such a deep question. You know? It's so profound. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And again, you're, the why Sometimes uh, whys also can get us caught in the mind. How do you, how do you ask why from the heart? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a deep why. One that goes to what's really at stake here? What's really going on? And, um, you know, I, I, I 
I can remember as a child, my father worked in the, the telecommunications industry. And um, as a young child, I knew that he was something, doing something really important. I knew why he went away on, on, at, on business because he was, he was helping put a phone in every home in Australia. Hmm. Yeah. So that deep why engages profoundly. I remember working in Shanghai in the, in the, in the late 90s and um, we gathered the organisation, the growing organisation together. We, we started to get clear on why we are working. Why are we doing this? And uh, they came up with a clear sense of purpose that they wanted to prove to the world that they could do this better than anybody. Uh -huh. Great. And that, that just drove an extraordinary focus of effort and energy. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. So also uh, you've been using metaphors and, but the mind uses metaphors all the time. It's, mm -hmm. it's, we're relating to the world through our filters, through mm -hmm. our beliefs, through our ideas about the way it is. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have this wonderful uh, uh, metaphor or analogy that talks about that having to do with metaphors. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, uh, you know, metaphors are really, they, they really open up the depths of who we are. Often working with people, I ask them, I would start, I often start with something like life is and ask people to fill in the rest of the sentence. You know, and some people would say, oh, life's a struggle. Life's a bitch. Life's a joy. Life's a bowl of cherries. Life's easy. And just that, that one-liner starts to indicate how they approach life. Yes. And so, you know, the, the metaphors we hold really, really influence how we do things, who we are. And... And I found it so fascinating working in the business world that so many of the metaphors come from the sporting world. Yes. Oh, they love yeah. sporting metaphors. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, <laughs> it's like got kicking goals and, you know, and sort of improvements and uh, targets and deadlines and uh, they're playing hardball. Yeah? And so right, much right, the right. language yes, is, yes. is sporting. Now, fabulous stuff. Nothing wrong with that at all. Because it engages people. That's, that's yes, what metaphors yes. do. People can relate to it, yeah. Absolutely. Yet, um, yet that sort of metaphor is still, it, it's still, um, you know, the coach is in the telling realm. It's still horizontal. Yes. And um, so I, I used to often offer a different metaphor for the leader as a host. Now, again, that is something we all know about. We've all, we've all either hosted a good party or dinner party, or we've all, we've all experienced at least one really good party where the host did an extraordinary job. And so changing the metaphor for a leader, from being a coach to being a host, so simple, yet so profound. And everyone intuitively knows what that means. And if you think about it, a host, a good host sets up the environment provides the context, provides the, the ingredients, the food, the alcohol, the, the music, depending on what sort of party or setting we're having. And, uh, and they, yet they don't control things. They right. act like a cat. They you can't like control a party. <laughs> of course not. Yeah. So a good host was like, have you met so-and-so? Oh, do, do you, and they would connect people. Yes, or they yes. may sit people next to each other to stimulate a good conversation. Yes, or yes. they may, you know, say what a, they may change the, the depth of the conversation. Or they 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 interact, they stimulate, they nudge, but they don't control, and and everybody just self organizes, and the party is you, you know extraordinary. Yes. And if we actually start to apply that into our work life, get very very different result. Yes. Well, you're aren't you in that case? when you're applying it into work, aren't you trusting that 
each person's innate intelligence and, and intuition, uh, if you create the right environment for it, mm -hmm. is, is going to lead them into what's most efficient for their work and everyone else's. Nailed it in one, Hallie. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. like I, I remember a couple of years ago now, I was invited to New Zealand by the Minister of Sport because uh -huh. the government was, um, they were looking at how they could engage, more deeply engage participation in sport across New Zealand because they're looking at health. Yes. People are active and healthy. And the younger generation were just, were not so engaged. So they had their, their, their annual conference and they had several hundred people there. And these are all the top administrators and bureaucrats from you know, the, the Olympic Committee was there, the, the sports, the cricket administrators, rugby, tennis. They'd go. And, and of course, they would engage the local community as coaches. <laughs> They would tell people what they were going to do and what they wanted them to do. And it right, what they should do. Right, yeah, right. and it just wasn't working the way it used to. No. So I suggested this metaphor of the host. And it really, it, it struck home with many people. So they started to re-engage local communities as, as the host. You know, what do you need? How can we support you? Oh, they're much better. Uh, you know, and of course, the engagement level went up, particularly with the with the younger generation, because they were they were they were offered autonomy, just as you right, 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 right. Trusting people's intelligence to self organize and sort yes. out what they needed and wanted. That's perfect. Yeah. 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 Great story. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, also, you talk about. Um, you talk about the importance of letting go of the fantasy of control. Can you yeah. can you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, it's, uh, this gets to the core of the issues with so many people. Yeah, because that's this fear of of letting go, this fear of losing control, is why so many of us hold on so tightly. And when you see see that that there is no control. Everything self-organizes. Mm. Yeah. It's like when you start to look deeply at life, everything is networks. Networks are the, are the, are the way living systems self-organize. Yes. And everything always spontaneously organizes and reorganizes. Yeah. I mean, there's a, um, there's a key word here, emergence. And that is, um, and whether we're talking about the weather system, the the cells in in our, in our bloodstream, a social group, or an ecology, it all interacts. And there's patterns of interaction, and these patterns start to form, and they change the way we interact, and new things emerge. I mean, there's, there's an analogy we've all seen many times. You know, you're out in the country, you see a flock of birds flying and they're flying and they suddenly they all change direction as one. Or a school of fish swimming and the fish just suddenly, in a nanosecond, all change direction. Now, this puzzled scientists and naturalists for, for decades, a lot of last century, people were exploring, how do they do this? Why do they do it? How does it work? And of course, looking through the mental model of control, who's the head bird? Right. <laughs> who's, who's, and I, they sometimes look for that too, I know. <laughs> absolutely. Who's the lead fish? And of course, so the answer just completely eluded. It's only relatively recently with the increasing capacities of computers that they've created mathematical computer simulations and discovered the laws governing this. And whether, or whether we're talking about a flock of birds or a school of fish, there are three rules which govern all this behavior. Number one, each bird keeps more or less the same distance from each other. Number two, they all fly at about the same speed. Number three, they all move to the center. And that just creates this extraordinary, spontaneous, self-organizing pattern, which moves and changes. 
Yes. And, you know, our businesses are like that. Yes. Our, our families are like that. Our friendships are like that. And you, you can't tr control anything. You're like trying to control your thoughts. <laughs> Try to predict what the next thought's going to be. Nobody knows. It just, it all, everything arises. And so learning to be a host and just be present, be available, provide the conditions and the inputs that stimulate, nudge and encourage and allow everything to just to move and flow. It's definitely. Far yeah. more creative. And what's that? Far more creative and much more oh, yeah. fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. much more the, that, that basic harmony that you can see in nature, like you mentioned. Mm. I, I, I live in a place where there are shorebirds that are, spend a part of the year here. And when mm. they fly, it's magnificent because mm. there will be a thousands of them in the sky at the same time. And then they'll turn at, mm. in, in sync and they, the, the flocks change shape, but it's always mm. this unified thing. And also depending on the light, mm. sometimes you can see the flock and then if they turn, sometimes the flock just disappears for a second. Yeah. And that has, it, it, it's a beautiful thing to watch, but it's something that's going on all the time in life, isn't it? Mm. That, that universal awareness or beingness or whatever you want to call it mm. is, is really the underlying organizing principle of everything that we're experiencing. Mm. And it, it's not up, up to us individually. It's we're part of the, that universing one unified, uh, unified principle and it's functioning through all form. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. The, the business world is not an exception to that, right? Yeah. Of course, how could it be? You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. this, this same intelligence flows through everything. Yes. Uh, decades ago, a David Bohm, a quantum physicist said that uh, Unbroken wholeness. Everything is just unbroken wholeness. Yes. Just flowing, interconnected. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Unbroken wholeness. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So uh, anything else you want to add be, before we conclude? We've covered quite a bit. Yeah, we have. We've, yes. Well, look, it's uh, just on that, I... That, I remember one of my teachers, this old Aboriginal master, and I, I went to see him this, uh, about 30 years ago. And uh, I knew at the time that what he would do with people, he would walk them along the song lines to discover the mysteries of this ancient land we live in. And so I went to see him with a couple of, of my consultants and, and we had all our boots on, we were ready to walk. Mm -hmm. And he looked at us and he said, these fellas need to sit. <laughs> and he sat us down for 10 days, just sitting. We hardly moved more than a few metres from the spot. And he would just sit there and he would reach over and say, oh, look at this. See this? And he picked something up. This we, we, made, we used to make medicine. Oh, and this here? We used to make shoes from, moccasins from this. And with hardly moving, he was just pointing out that we were actually living in the supermarket. <laughs> and um, he, he had this beautiful expression, the every when. Say that again. The every when. The every when. Hmm. And that's what we're talking about, this every when. Timeless, beginningless, endless. The every when, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. So thank you. This was a beautiful conversation. And uh, all the things that Peter talked about are certainly applicable into your everyday life. Yes. They aren't just useful in the business environment. And uh, as, as you allow yourself to explore what he was talking about, I think you'll find great benefit in it. So thank you, Peter. I really appreciate your sharing your wisdom. Mm. Yeah. 
and, and, and how it just, I would just simply encourage everyone to really work on their own transformation. Yes. Real deep development. And learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. And just, it's okay to not know, just to rest in the unknowing. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Peter Lowry. You can learn more about Peter at nonduality.com.au. That's nonduality.com.au. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor Lester Levinson's work, and the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you'll learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to Sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A.com. Thank you for being here, and we'll catch you in the next episode of Letting Go and the Greatest Secret.